This happened over a decade ago. Close to 15 years ago, actually. I was just a 14-year-old boy living in a small town with my parents. It was a really close-knit farming community in the Midwest of the United States. The only thing that really put our town on the map was that it had the only train station in the area. Because of that, we would occasionally see outsiders wandering around the streets. They would never stay long though. Other than that, everyone knew each other. My friends and I loved to hang out in the schoolyard late at night during the summer months. There wasn't really anywhere else for us to go. There was no arcade, no skate park, and we were too cheap to see a movie at the small theater in town. That's not a great way to socialize anyway. In the winter months, alcohol was a bigger part of our lives, but this took place in the summer. It was a warm July evening, probably close to midnight, and we were sitting on the swings in the schoolyard. The moon was full, and it cast a mild light on everything. We were just talking about nonsense, sharing a cigarette that my friend Zach stole from his dad. As time went on, a thick sheet of clouds covered the moon, and it went dark. When the moon reappeared, a man came out of nowhere. He was walking towards us. He looked to be in his late forties, with shaggy brown hair and a short beard that was mostly grey. He wore a dirty white t-shirt and torn jeans. We knew right away that he wasn't from our town, because we would have known him if he was. This guy must have been passing through, and that made us really scared. Hey kids, what are you doing out here so late? He asked in an interrogating tone. We all exchanged glances, a little unnerved by the stranger's sudden appearance, but we didn't want to be rude, so we answered politely. Just hanging out, sir, I said. The man smiled, and I noticed his teeth were yellow and crooked. That's cool, he said, trying to sound like he was much younger than he was. We went back and forth for a while. He was asking us all kinds of questions, and we were answering with a single word most of the time. It must have been pretty obvious that we were uncomfortable. We really wanted him to leave, but none of us said it directly. After five minutes or so, the man said that he had something cool to show us, and asked us to follow him. I felt a cold shiver run down my spine, and I saw the same fear in my friend's eyes. We knew this was not right, and we knew we had to get out of there. No thank you, I said firmly. We have to go home now. But the man wasn't satisfied. He took a step forward. Come on, don't be afraid. I won't hurt you. I just want to show you something. That's when I saw the glint of something metallic in his hand. I realized with horror that he was holding a knife. Run, I shouted to my friends, and we all took off in different directions. I ran as fast as I could, faster than I thought possible. I didn't look back, so I don't know which one of us, if any, he was chasing. I was afraid for my life, so I just kept running. But then, I saw the lights of my house in the distance. I kept running, and I burst in the front door, grasping for breath. My parents were already in bed, so I ran up the stairs and woke them up. Jason, what's wrong? My mom asked, concerned etched on her face. I was so out of breath that I couldn't even speak. But eventually, I managed to blurt out the whole story. My parents listened, their faces turning pale. We have to call the police, my dad said reaching for the phone. Within minutes, the police arrived. One of my friends had already called, and they were at his place. Me and my friends gave them a description of the man. They searched the schoolyard and the surrounding area, but they couldn't find him. Our best guess was that he was hiding in the woods on the south side of town, which is not far from the school. It was really big news for a while. For months afterwards, the whole community was on edge. Everyone was locking their doors, and most kids had to be home before dark. The police searched for a while, but they never found the man. Rumor has it that they found a spot in the woods that looked like it had been used as a campsite. There was an old tent and piles of trash, just food wrappers and beer cans we heard. I think that's probably where the guy was staying, probably where he was going to bring us.
This happened about eight years ago. I was 17 years old, living in the suburbs of a small city with my mom, dad, and little sister. I also had a best friend named Ryan, who lived just a five minute walk away from me. We spent most of our free time in the woods surrounding our neighborhood, exploring and just hanging out. There wasn't a whole lot to do where we come from other than that. One night, Ryan and some of our other friends had a fire in our friend Tammy's backyard. She lived on a small farm not far away. It was late, probably 11 p.m., when me and Ryan decided to head back home. It was about a 45 minute walk. We were on a dirt road leading back to our area. The forest was on our right, but it was faster to take the road, even though we knew the trails in the forest really well. While we were walking, a car suddenly pulled up behind us. We saw the headlights from quite a distance away, but we thought it would just drive on by. It was an old beat up car, and I remember feeling creeped out when the driver rolled down his window. He asked us for directions for a town called Havebrook. Ryan and I looked at each other. Neither of us had ever heard of the town. We had lived there for our whole lives, and if it was anywhere nearby, we would know. Maybe he was more lost than he realized. We didn't know, but we told the guy that we had never heard of the town. As we started to walk away, the car pulled up beside us and drove slowly. He leaned over and offered us a ride. We declined politely, but he persisted. He kept asking and we kept saying no. We started walking faster, but he kept following. It was an awkward couple of minutes with us walking, but trying not to look at the guy. Eventually, I couldn't resist. I turned my head in his direction. As soon as I made eye contact with the man, I felt really scared. Ryan and I both broke into a run, but the car sped up, following us on the dirt path. We were running for our lives now, unsure what the guy wanted from us. We knew we had to lose him somehow, so we ran as fast as we could into the woods. I thought that would be enough to lose him, but when I looked back, I saw the car parked on the side of the road. There was a dark silhouette of the man chasing us into the forest. We were pretty much crying at this point. Neither of us knew what that guy wanted, and we had no idea what he would do if he caught us. He must have been some kind of a murderer or something, I thought. There was no other explanation. After a few minutes, we were out of breath, so we hid behind a large tree to rest. We crouched there, watching the trail that we had been following. The man stomped closer to us and stopped 30 or 40 feet up the trail from us. We peeked over. There was just enough moonlight seeping through the trees that we could see the man. He looked around, panting. Ryan and I were almost holding our breath to avoid making any noise. After a few minutes, the guy finally turned around and went back in the opposite direction. We waited another few minutes and then came out and made our way back home through the forest. We were both shaken up by the incident and we immediately told our parents what happened. We reported it to the police, and although they searched, the man was never found. I live in Cincinnati, but I grew up in Washington, which is where my parents still live. I have to travel back a few times each year to see my parents for holidays and things like that. My cousin Susan also lives in Cincinnati and makes the same trip, so we always go together. I have a car, so she comes with me and chips in a bit for gas. This incident took place last year, before the Thanksgiving break. We had been driving for a few hours, stopping only for gas and snacks. As we drove along the highway, we spotted a sign for a small town just off the next exit. We were ready to get some real food, so we decided to check it out. We pulled into the parking lot of the only restaurant in the town. The place was a small rundown diner with peeling paint and a neon sign that flickered on and off. Inside, the walls were covered with yellowish pictures and old newspaper clippings. The smell of fried food and stale coffee filled the air. It wasn't exactly a five-star restaurant, but we were hungry and it was the only place around. 
We took a seat at a booth by the window and scanned the menu. The waitress, a middle-aged woman, came over and took our order. I ordered a burger and fries, while Susan went for the grilled cheese sandwich. As we waited for our food, I couldn't help but people watch. The diner was surprisingly busy for such a small town. There were truckers and locals filling up the booths and the counter. There was a group of old men at a table in the corner, playing cards, and a young couple with a baby was sitting in a booth by the door, trying to keep the child from crying. Just when our food arrived, the door to the diner burst open, and a man rushed in. He was wearing dark clothes, with a mask and a hood. He looked like bad news. I watched him make his way to the counter. When he got there, he shouted for the money from the register. I slumped down in my seat, still watching him. The waitress behind the counter trembled as she fumbled with the register. Her hands were seriously shaking. That was when I noticed that the man was holding a gun. Susan and I looked at each other. We were both terrified. The other patrons in the diner were stunned as well. The waitress handed a wad of cash to the man. I couldn't tell how much it was. He swiped it out of her hands and ran out the door. He was gone as fast as he came in. Seconds later, we heard police sirens. They were close already. I looked out the window behind me and saw the robber was being arrested right in the street. We stayed and spoke to the officers for a while, but they let us go because there were so many other witnesses. As we left the diner and got back into my car, we were both shaken up. We drove in silence for a while, the events of the past hour still fresh in our minds. The rest of the trip seemed to blur by after that incident. I dropped Susan off at my aunt and uncle's house, but I didn't come in. All I wanted was to get home and go to bed. I eventually told my parents what happened, but they had already heard it from Susan and her parents. It was a scary thing that happened to us that day, but we weren't hurt, and we came out with a crazy story to tell. This happened to me and my sister when we were kids. My family and I would spend a week every year at my uncle's cottage. It was a perfect place for a summer getaway, and we were always excited to go there. It was right on Lake Huron, but there was a white sand beach that could almost pass for somewhere in the Caribbean. Not quite, but almost. The cottage was cozy and rustic. It had almost a log cabin feel, and it smelled like pine trees. There was a wood stove that we used for heat, even though there was electricity as well. We spent our evenings playing board games and telling stories in front of the fireplace. On our second day there, my sister Julie and I decided to go for a walk on the beach. Our uncle had a metal detector, and we would use it to search for treasure. All we would find most of the time were bottle caps. We made a game out of collecting as many different kinds as possible though, and it was kind of fun. The sun was shining, and the water was sparkling in the distance. We strolled along the shore, talking about nothing in particular. Eventually we wandered off into a part of the beach where we had never been before. We had to walk through some tall grass to get there. As we were walking, the metal detector went off. It was something big. I dug it up and found something. It looked like a toy gun, but it was heavy, really heavy. Julie looked at it and immediately thought it was real. I don't know how she knew. She was only a year older than me, and definitely didn't have any real experience with guns, but maybe she was just more cautious. She told me to put it down, and we went to tell our parents. My mom and dad were sitting on the porch of the cottage when we approached them. We told them what we had found and where it was. They thought it was probably fake at first, but my dad went to check it out anyway. When he came back, he called the police. My dad thought it was real too. Within minutes, a patrol car arrived and two officers got out. They went to the gun and examined it. They took it with them and disappeared. We later found out that the gun had been used in a robbery several months earlier where someone had been shot. Luckily he survived, but the gun was a key piece of evidence. After that incident, 
We were all a bit scared. For a while after that, my parents didn't let us explore with the metal detector alone. But eventually, things went back to normal. <laughs>